Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Morbid early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. Hey, weirdos, I'm Ash. And I'm Elena. And this is Morbid. We're back. We're back and we're better than ever. That's right. And I'm not snarfing and coughing as much as I was. We love that. So this is new and Ash is back. She was only gone for one, but that's fine. Yeah. Did you miss me? Did you miss her? Oh, no. I was asking you. Oh, I did. Did you miss me? Good. But I had Caleb to talk about cryptids with. I know. That's why I asked if you missed me because it's like hard when you you, like replace me with somebody so wonderful. (laughs) You know? He is pretty wonderful. I love that man. But you know what? You're both wonderful in your own ways. Thank you. You know, thank but. you so much. I know me and Drew were talking about Caleb last night and he was like, I miss Caleb. I was like, you could probably tell him that and he would just get on a plane or like start driving. Truthfully. Yeah. Truthfully. <laughs> I believe that wholeheartedly that yeah. Caleb would just jump in some form of transportation and be here with him. be like, I'm on my way. The correct amount of hours yeah. that it would take. Honestly. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be able to host him right now because my spare bedroom is literally filled to the brim with laundry. And then this weekend we're we were there. like... Oh, we're going to do that laundry. Like, let's no. start it. Oh, no, we did. We started to. Oh. And then my wash machine made this noise. It said. <laughs> and we figured Whoa. it's probably broken. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be. Yeah. Also, don't make me laugh too hard because I have gunkus. Oh, you got the same thing I got. I'm yeah. still in that. This is going to be pretty funny, actually, because yeah. if we make each other laugh, we're going to sound like we are actively dying. Yeah. So, I sound like I have a disease. Yeah, like me too. If I laugh, I mm-hmm. sound like I have like destroyed my lungs for years. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know? Yeah. Well, illness. it kind of goes along with this story. I feel like you need to have like a hard way about you. Oh, I like, like that. Like gunk in the throat crazy yeah. chain smoker laugh all right cool it just like fits for the story i um, gotta be like polly from peaky blinders okay so it's funny that you just said peaky blinders i have never watched peaky blinders but although like, you should i've seen i know i should it's, really it's hard because drew doesn't like a period piece but you know what? And he considers one? anything like that is not now. in the past a period piece <laughs> it's so good though. like i think succession was a period because it was like him. a couple years ago <laughs> literally <laughs> yeah the, no peaky blinders is so good though and it's got killian murphy in it like I know. My BFF Kaylee and her boyfriend are obsessed with Thomas it. Thomas Shelby. I know. For life. And he is really No matter good what he does. You can do the worst shit ever. And I'm like, I forgive him. It's okay. He's a good man. Well, I'm worried <laughs> about how you're going to react to this story then. Uh-oh. Because there's actually a Tommy in this. Oh. And he's like one of the main culprits. Um, today we're going to talk about the Glasgow ice cream wars. Ooh. Which is bonkers. Like you hear ice cream and you're like, oh, like ice cream yum. yeah love that but who ice doesn't cream, love ice cream you scream we all scream for ice cream everybody does but we're really all screaming over like this case because it's fucking bonkers Ooh. and it's like i said the ice cream wars but not like food network holiday or like cake wars i was gonna say because this sounds delightful it does it sounds like a holiday special on the food network sure does. um it's anything but that cool. essentially we're talking arson we're talking drugs we're talking guns we're talking murder and straight up war so All not right. Food Networky, not not completely. No, no, yeah. not really. It's a few little errant differences there. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. You're, you're right. But it all started with Andrew, quote unquote, Fat Boy Doyle, and that was like a term of endearment. So yeah, I'm not I'm not calling him that. That's what his family called him, and yeah. it was like a loving term. So I'm gonna stick with it. It was a, it was a nickname. It was a nickname. So this is Andrew Fatboy Doyle. He took over the lucrative ice cream van route in Glasgow's Rukesi. I believe I'm saying that right. I looked it up um, and it sounded like that when I heard it to my ear. But then I just realized, I think I'm saying Glasgow. Yeah. It's Glasgow. 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 Yeah. God, so much stress for I know, it's hard. And there's a lot of names in this that I looked up and I like wrote my own phonetic spelling. So I hope I'm doing it right. You are. Just yell at me if not. You will anyway. I'll yell at you. Not you. The internet will yell. No, the internet will yell at me. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's it's (laughs) your fault. (laughs) Exactly. Well, anyway, so he took over the lucrative ice cream van route um, in the Rukesi housing estate in the early 1980s. He knew that he was kind of encroaching on the territory of established van drivers who were not going to let their roots go without a fight. Like many ice cream van drivers in the late 70s and 80s, Glasgow, in Glasgow, go. Fuck. It's throwing me off. 
<laughs> go to Glasgow. There you go. But like many of those drivers, he knew that there was more money to be made selling illegal goods on van routes than there was in more respectable trades. And he kind of hoped to get in on the action. Yeah. From what I've read, it doesn't necessarily seem like he, he didn't want to sell like drugs or anything like that because that's what was happening on these van routes. They were selling Toilet paper, cigarettes, beer, wine, and drugs. Contraband. Yeah, contraband. <laughs> it was illegal to sell, like, you know, the toilet paper and stuff like that. You weren't supposed to do that. Yeah. Um, very illegal to sell drugs. Very. He yeah. wasn't into, like, the whole drug thing of it. He didn't want to do that, but he wanted a route of his own to sell what he wanted to sell. Yeah. So his rivals, though, were not going to let their territory go without a fight. They were very intent on holding down their businesses. They didn't want to let newcomers in. And they would stop at absolutely fucking nothing to make that clear. They started attacking van drivers. They started attacking customers at certain points. Ooh. Now, this war, quote unquote war, would conclude in April of uh, 1984. But it didn't end with like somebody waving a white flag and being like, you know, this is Truth, so silly. Guys. Why don't you have this route? I'll take this route. Yeah. Kumbaya, baby. No, no, no. It literally ended with a fiery blaze and with six members of the Doyle family being brutally, brutally murdered. Damn. All over an ice cream van Holy route. shit. Yeah. The Glasgow... Uh, I did that right You now. did it right. Yeah, okay. yeah, you got it. <laughs> the Glasgow ice cream wars and the murder of the Doyle family really obviously outraged the Scottish public. And they demanded that the authorities do whatever was necessary to bring an end to this whole gang war that kind of started. And at this point, it was just overrunning the streets. But the police, obviously wanting all this activity to end, they quickly arrested six men for the murders. And as we know, it's like never really good when there's a quick arrest. No. It's like sometimes, it, you know, you're like, sometimes oh, Sometimes wow. it works out. But like, but you never, I never really want to hear the word like quickly arrested. Yeah. Which sounds crazy. No, because I know what you mean, though, because it's like. Whenever you hear that the public was in this outrage and everybody was freaking out and it's like there was all this pressure. Yeah. And then oh, oh, they just quickly they just arrested this some guys. Whole chunk of suspects that they know did it. It's like Ooh. I understand what might be happening here. Yeah. Exactly. But I don't know. I don't know anything about this case actually. Neither so this did is I. brand new to me. Neither did I. Well, two of those six men were sent to prison for life for the mass murders of the Doyle family. And after nearly two decades though, information came to light that seriously cast a doubt on the guilt of those men and the extent to which the Strath, uh, Strathclyde police and potentially even the entire Scottish legal system were willing to go in order to make that problem go away. Damn. So it's kind of one of those things where they were feeling the pressure. It seems like anyway, they were feeling the pressure and they needed to put some amount of people in, yeah. in prison. But let's head back to the 70s for the sake of the story. Let's do it. So throughout the 1970s, the Scottish government started clearing out what were known, it's not a nice thing to say, but what were known back then as the slums of Glasgow. And they were relocating the residents to newly constructed high-rise uh, housing estates like the Rukesi housing estate. Now, a lot of times the rents were kind of subsidized for low-income families, that whole deal. And for the most part, the housing estates were built and managed by local government agencies trying to solve a problem but at the same time they were sort of just adding to it mm, you that know makes sense that's when usually you, what happens when you like dislocate and then relocate people there's going to be some problems that go yeah. along with that because many of the poorer residents were like i just said completely dislocated which added to the desperation and then led to an increase of crime mm -hmm. the new low-income homes were usually located on the outskirts of the city which meant that there wasn't easy access to resources and even just like essential items like grocery stores and social services stuff yeah. like that especially for those that didn't have a car and back then not everybody was tooting along in a brand no, new whip not. you know now the government at the time couldn't really get together a sustainable solution. I know that's like so crazy to think about. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. So people took it upon themselves because they really had no other option. And this is when informal businesses and services like the ice cream vans in Glasgow, Rukesi's estate, came into play. So the ice cream vans were said to have sold everything, quote, from fish to cigarettes. And they were really like, quote unquote, general stores on wheels. I love that. <laughs> it's really cool to think about. It is kind of cool. Because there weren't local markets or even bus lines in these areas. Yeah, so these are just rolling general stores. Exactly. The ice cream vans became lifelines to the residents in these estates if they needed to get stuff. 
Now, at first, the ice cream vans were pretty much how they are here in America, like today. They were just vans filled with all kinds of treats, rolling around the little areas in town, playing music, selling said treats. But the summer season in the UK is, one, pretty short, and two, pretty unpredictable. So when it wasn't chilly and rainy, people weren't necessarily looking for ice cream, but they were looking for snacks and daily use items, and from time to time, some drugs. Yeah, just time to time. You know, think yeah. Uber Eats or DoorDash before it's time, but uh, with less big business ties. There you go. The people driving these vans weren't going through background checks. They weren't having to, like, provide a license. No, Nothing like that, not. really. You could pretty much just get a van, get into it, and start Sell your little cream. business. It was like a startup, yeah. After you got your van, you'd have to set up some kind of, um, like, buying some kind of stock from a local distributor or a dealer, if that was part of your business model, oh. and you were ready to go. But for those that couldn't afford to buy a van outright, they could actually lease uh, a van either weekly or monthly. Oh, okay. There was, like, organizations where you could go to. This was far less, or excuse me, far more common because... As I've made it clear, these areas were not, like, flushed with cash. <laughs> Sorry, John Ralphio. <laughs> Don't want to take your flow. Sorry. But in this model, the leasing firm was responsible for the maintenance of the van, getting it insured, and any other fees that were associated with operating it. And the driver had to cover the cost of gas and the stock of his or her products. Because uh, back then, like, women were driving these vans, too. Yeah. Now, the trade-off with this way of doing it was that the driver was paid about 50 or 60 pounds a week, and the rest of the profits went to the leasing company. Okay. So that's how they made their money. Yeah. It didn't bring in as much money for the drivers as it did for drivers who could buy their own van, but it was more affordable, and there was still a profit to be made for drivers that could find and keep a good route. But yeah. that was kind of the crux of the issue, finding it the route was one thing that was like lucky in and of itself, but then keeping the route was even more intense. This is when the territory stuff probably comes into play. Yeah, exactly. Now, because unemployment rates were really, really high right after the end of World War II, and there wasn't as much opportunity for formal employment, the competition for van routes began instantly. According to Douglas Skelton, who co-authored the book Frighteners with uh, fellow journalist Lisa Brownlie, I believe is how you say it, back in those days, quote, the dirty tricks had been limited to schoolboyish acts like squirting windscreens with the raspberry <laughs> liquid used to flavor the vanilla Stop. ice cream and double stopping. Now, double stopping was when one driver followed a rival driver to their route and like cut ahead of them to steal their business. Wow. Yeah. So it was pretty. This is like, that's like little kid shit. It was pretty innocent when it first yeah. started. Like, like just squirting raspberry shit on the windshield. That's, that's like funny. funny. Yeah, exactly. Like, annoying, but funny. Yeah. You know, turn you your windshield wipers off. on. You're yeah. Good. Yeah. The, it was when it got like later into things that uh, it wasn't really just like raspberry coming out your windshield. Well, you it know? was like sledgehammers. Oh, okay. Literally. That's, that's different. A little bit. That hits a little, that literally hits a little different. Quite literally. <laughs> like, quite literally. Hits Raspberry different. liquid versus sledgehammer, sledgehammer to the face. One is just turning on your windshield wiper, maybe getting some new windshield wiper fluid because you used a little bit too much. Yeah. The other one is getting an entirely new windshield. So And face. And face. You're yeah, right. You know? That, yep. Yeah. And maybe like a plastic surgery hurt. appointment. Yeah. That would hurt. Yeah. Damn. They were like a bunch of shade queens. That escalated so quickly. It did. So by the late 1970s, when unemployment in Glasgow's northeast estates like Rukesi was between 40 and 50 percent, a legit ice cream van operator could make upwards of 200 euros. I think it's euros. Yeah. Per week selling ice cream. Wow. And as much as 800 a week. Wow. If, All right. So this is like a desirable. Oh, yeah. If absolutely. you can make it, you can make it. Right. And the people that were making closer to like 800 a week, that was, quote, if the operator was willing to sell stolen cigarettes, sweets yeah. and soft drinks. And right. this is unquote, but drugs. And uh, drugs. And uh, drugs. <laughs> and the drugs. And like I said, people were willing to go to bat for these routes because they desperately needed that kind of money. Yeah. But now the quote unquote schoolboyish pranks and silly tactics had escalated. That's no fun. I really like the just spraying with the raspberry, raspberry liquid. shit. Like, oh, it's, that was just good, wholesome fun. Yeah, it's like a clown, you know, yeah. like with a little flower. But you know what? Desperation. Mm -hmm. Now, drivers in this new period of time, like I said, would vandalize other vans, sabotage them, threaten the other drivers pretty much every time it became physical. Ugh. And this was all so that a driver could keep the best route. What a toxic work environment. The most toxic work Imagine environment. Imagine coming in every day to work. No. 
And you have to deal with like, you're like, I don't know what's going to happen today. Like, you know what I mean? And not in a good way. Like, it's Oh, a, no. They had to make like literal alliances and like hire people to watch out for them and hire oh, people. And we'll get into all that. That's so much work. But the increase in violence was particularly alarming in the poor and working class neighborhoods. But it also wasn't just confined to those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It was alarming there because it was scary, but it wasn't just those neighborhoods. In the early uh, 1980s London, drivers were also engaging in a myriad of tactics to protect those more lucrative routes and also resorting to violence. In December of 1981, three men from the Piccadilly Whip Ice Cream Company were put in jail for an intimidation campaign on another driver that escalated to a really violent point. These men had attempted to scare this driver, his name was Anthony Sh uh, Sherburn, from his site outside of a Harrods department store, but their tactics weren't working. Like, they were kind of just threatening him verbally. <laughs> so when they realized that wasn't working, they drove a truck into his van and then beat him to the point that he, quote, lost his two front teeth oh! and had two broken ribs. Oh, my God. Yeah. So that's where it all started. Holy shit. Now, at the start of the 1980s, there were three leasing firms behind the ice cream van industry. They were the Viking Ice Cream Company, uh, Capaldi, and the Mar... Mar I'm going to look this up. Hold on. I didn't know if it was Marchetti or Marchetti, but according to pronouncenames.com, <laughs> it's Marchetti. <laughs> Marchetti. So yeah, we had all those companies just, you know, leasing out the, the vans for the ice cream people. Now, until the uh, early 1980s, all three of these companies were regularly profiting from leasing out their vans and selling products to the self-employed drivers. But by 1982, all three companies were reporting annual losses. And they attributed these losses to, quote, loss of sales, repairs to vans. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. And all the difficulties of starting new drivers. Because who the fuck wants to join this business? Now that it's become this. Yeah, exactly. Like, you got to... There's a very specific person that will weigh the the risk, the cost and cost and reward here. Yeah, a little pro and, and con like, list. Oh, well, yeah, like somebody just got beaten so badly that their front two their two front teeth are gone, and they broke two ribs, and broke two ribs, and you're like, is it worth it? And they also drove a fucking uh, yeah. truck into the side of his van. What if he had been in the van? It's a liability, man. It is. <laughs> so by the final quarter of 1983, vans were constantly being turned to the Marchetti brothers' garage with smashed windows, broken headlights, just. Any kind of vandalism you could think about, it, these vans were suffering it. Yeah. And it was all meant to encourage drivers to give up their routes. I'm Ash. And I'm Elena. We host the hit show Morbid. Normally, we focus on what happens in the lead up to death. But this time, it's about what happens next. If you had the chance to be brought back to life hundreds of years in the future, would you take it? Lawrence Pilgrim, a lifelong scientist, planned for death his entire life. Because for him, death wasn't the end. It was just the beginning. Wondery's new podcast, Frozen Head, tells the story of a man obsessed with immortality and the lengths he'll go to bring his wife with him against her wishes, tearing their family apart in the process. Follow Frozen Head wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Prime members, you can binge the entire series ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Jill Evans has it all. A big house, fast car, and a great career as a decorated police sergeant in Wales. But when it comes to love, she can just never seem to get things right. And after multiple failed engagements, Jill is starting to think it's just never going to happen for her. That is, until she connects online with a charming, handsome, and successful man named Dean Jenkins. From the outside, there may be some red flags, but Jill doesn't care. He's the one. And just six months in, Jill finds out she's pregnant, and they make plans to spend the rest of their lives together. But the night after Halloween, Jill receives a shocking text that will change everything. And what she reads threatens to take away her dreams of happiness, her career, and maybe even her freedom. Wondery and Novel's new podcast, Stolen Hearts, tells the intricate love story of Jill and Dean and how opposites really do attract. Follow Stolen Hearts on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Hey, Prime members, you can binge the entire series ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. So now we really get into the beginning of the ice cream wars. Because this was bringing in so much money and because there really wasn't a lot of law enforcement around the estates where the van schemes were, were, they were kind of now attracting a more criminal element. These dudes who wanted an easy way to quickly and easily offload stolen cigarettes and other Mm -hmm. goods that could be sold on the ice cream vans, they had their perfect ticket. Oh, yeah. This is like the ideal thing now. Yeah. Now, while there had been clearly a lot of conflict among drivers from the very beginning, the trouble reached New Heights actually, now we're going to go back a second, to 1978 between drivers from the Marchetti brothers and 50 Ices. This is kind of like where the main tensions lie from the late 70s all the way to like the mid 1980s. And these are all names of like ice cream things? Yeah. Ices. Yeah, it's um, okay. like the the leasing companies who own the okay. vans. So like the Marchetti brothers have their own vans that vans, run around. 50 like Ices fleet. has theirs. Exactly. Okay. It's like how there's um different taxi services. Yeah, you know? that makes sense. Yeah. And 50 Ices was a, a little bit of a smaller leasing firm. But that's where a lot of the tensions were between these two. This was primarily taking place in Glasgow's Barlanark neighborhood, For the most part, flare-ups between the groups were minimal, quote, as long as they stuck to their uh, respective sides of the scheme. So it was like, Marchetti Brothers could have this route, 50 ISIS drivers had this route. You do not cross routes. Never the two shall meet. Exactly. But every now and then, a member of one group would infringe upon the territory of another, causing yet another outbreak Of of violence and vandalism. And what also complicated things was that there were a lot of the working class people in this area They had ties or like some kind of connection to the Ulster Defense Association, which is the UDA. Oh. They were a Protestant paramilitary group that terrorized Northern Ireland and also parts of Scotland. And this meant that sometimes the religious affiliations between drivers led to even more violence. Oh, my God. The layers. It's crazy. It really doesn't it. it, From what I know of Peaky Blinders, it sounds like that. This is very, this is very Peaky Blinders. Yeah. Yeah. And just wait, I feel like it only got, like I said, never seen it. The vibes are here. But the vibes feel right. And it only, it only vibe years. Oh, yeah. Now, this was the case in October of 1978. Tensions were already super high between drivers working for Marchetti Brothers and 50 Ices. And things escalated when one of the drivers attacked the van of a driver from the rival company. So we have two rival drivers fighting with each other. Okay. Now, some members within that rival company also had ties to the UDA. And the police were starting to hear word that there was going to be some kind of retaliation for this fight between them. Oh, shit. And they were hearing that the UDA-affiliated members were getting ready and starting to arm themselves for some kind of big retaliation. Oh, my God. This is so Peaky Blinders. It's crazy. Now, the police knew some of the m- more notorious uh, key players, if you will. And they were able to get involved before anything escalated to the point of, like, what they thought was going to be a very bloody battle yeah. in the East End. But it only kind of put like a temporary band-aid on the overall problem. Throughout the rest of the year, there were regular small fights between the rivals. But those were kind of just hints at what was to come. When two van drivers from Glasgow's suburbs, uh, Dennistown and Easter House, started encroaching on routes in the Barlanark in early October, four Marchetti drivers began a campaign of intimidation, threats, and vandalism. And by the end of that month, it resulted in a serious assault on one of the suburban drivers. Jeez. The Marchetti drivers ended up being arrested and charged, but the charges were dismissed for all but one of them. Only one of them got the charges. And that man ended up being sentenced to serve five years in prison. Damn. Now, despite the one prison sentence, the campaign of intimidation and violence successfully did drive the suburban drivers out of the area, which, like along with the lack of consequences, showed that the violence was the answer when it came to protecting your route. I'd say that was a pretty bad move. If you get dismissed on all these charges and only one person gets in trouble, you're like, okay, so what are my odds of getting in trouble? I was just going to say, I'll play those odds. Why not? Exactly. Now, because the criminal activity among the East End drivers had gotten so fucking crazy, there were another group of people who saw this as an opportunity. Those people formed a protection racket Whoa. Yeah. This meant that drivers who wanted extra protection had to pay a fee to these hooligans willing to provide it for them. And for those that didn't, 
they were on they were on their own yeah like that's all you buddy damn now this was the case for a female driver sadie campbell she had started driving back in 1982 and in the beginning she was actually paying a protection fee because she was like you know what i'm not fucking with all this but then she found out that the people requiring this fee were doing so by means of extortion and at the time she was losing her profit because she's paying for this fee and it's really like ridiculous you know yeah of course they're extorting her and at this point she was finding it difficult to pay her bills so she stops paying it she's in a no-win situation now almost immediately her van is vandalized the windows were smashed in and somebody also slashed her tires now when her brother tommy found out what was going on tommy he went into he's like the main kind of guy in this he went into full-blown protective brother mode he tracked down the driver responsible and quote kicked his arse up and down the street this does sound like Tommy, uh, Thomas Shelby, sorry. Thomas Shelby. think of the name. I was like, Tommy. So this is Tommy Campbell, otherwise Tommy known Campbell. as TC. All right. But he was kicking people's arses yeah, up Hell yeah, he was. And he, uh, like kicking arse all while two police officers who decided not to intervene just watched from their car nearby. That is funny shit. The fight was incredibly intense. If you read about it, just know that there is, like, some animal cruelty involved. Oh. Um, Whoever he was fighting, like, stuck dogs on him, like, sent them to hurt him, and one of them ended up being killed. Oh. Really sad. That's sad. But, so he thinks he's taking care of this. He's like, you know what? I took care of this. I fought the guy responsible. A few weeks later, Sadie's van explodes. Holy shit. Luckily, she's not in it. Like a car bomb? Literal car bomb. Oh, my God. She's not in it, but that fully ended her career as an ice cream van driver wow she's like i'm done yeah i'd be good with that now even though he had just seen how fucking insane life could be in the ice cream trade tommy tc campbell was like you know what i think i got the street smarts for this let me join and he started in the fall of 1983 no isn't that fucking crazy why would you do that so instead of leasing a van from one of the firms he actually bought his own he described it as a clapped out banger that's right yeah that's how i would describe it as well a clapped out banger that's how i describe all my cars <laughs> clapped out banger don't make me laugh i'll start snarfing. sorry now when uh tc there got his clapped out banger hell yeah all set his wife liz also got a license to operate around that same time and she was going to be operating as a street vendor so she started her route in a neighborhood known as Hagel. and at the time she was the only van on that particular route which at you would time. think wow that's great i'm gonna have so much success here and she did and she made a lot of money for the time being i'm worried for her and that's the thing you wanted to get a successful route that nobody else had but it was also dangerous to get a successful route that nobody else did because uh someone would come along and start fucking with you and your van and try to take that over yeah that's not good and that was exactly the case with Liz. Oh, Liz. Once people heard that she had a successful route, she became a target and she started getting threatened. Now, apparently Tommy was also able to track down the guys who were messing with Liz. He just, of course he was. He's a bloodhound. Yeah. He, I think. You don't mess with the women in his life. You sure don't. Apparently. No. And this time he didn't even have to throw hands because he had a reputation. Oh. I mean, look what he had done with uh, his little sis there. Yeah. He, he pretty much cemented that right there. Yeah. So he just kind of took care of it. And yeah. that was that. He just gives a... He gives a stern face. Oh, yeah. He just, like, and he everybody, growls. Yeah, he just goes, ooh. Yeah. He just gives a little eyeball, and everyone's like, oh. You can, like, smell him coming. You, like, close yeah. your doors, hide your wife, hide your kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm one of those. I keep picturing him as, as Thomas Shelby, and that would mean that he would just always smell, like, you would always he- smell cigarettes coming, because Thomas Shelby is a chain smoker. Ugh. They all are. Like, Terrible. literally, that entire show is just cigarettes like all all the show i wonder what they smoke like they I must know smoke I, something I wonder. different right yeah they have to i'm like you would all be yeah in dire straits if you were smoking that much you know it's funny that you said that i was thinking that uh yesterday because i was watching girls next door obviously obviously and um it was the shoot where kendra dresses as Mae west oh, so yeah. she has like a cigarette holder and yeah. she's smoking like a what looks like a real cigarette yeah I was like, shit, like, like, what is that? Really just... But they must do something different for, like, a peaky. I would think. Where they're literally... I mean, they are... That's... 99.9% of the show is them lighting up cigarettes. I thought you were about to say 99.7, and I was like, 99.76% wow. of the show smoking ciggies is them lighting and smoking cigarettes. Oh, the smell of cigarettes. I, like, used to smoke cigarettes, which is a really embarrassing fact about me. <laughs> the smell of them now... <laughs> yeah i really don't like the smell of cigarettes so yuckas so yuckas 
Um, I would forgive it for Thomas Shelby, but <laughs> but not Ashkel. But not Ashkel. I no, will not. Elena got that. so mad at me. I did. Yeah, but it all worked out. I'm I'm uh, not a smoke guy. It was for it, it was for the best. Yeah, one hundred percent. Okay, okay. I wasn't bullying her. Elena's <laughs> <laughs> always bullying me. I am. It's you know that's why she's my maid of honor and everything. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, anyways, back to TC Tommy Campbell. Back to it. So he just had to look at them this time. He was like, fuck you guys. Fuck you guys. Except like Scottish. Yeah. I can't do that. It's a hard, the brogue is hard. It's difficult. Now, he didn't only have street cred with the van drivers and as the leader of the Gaucho Razor Gang. Uh, Of course. But he also was very well known to police. I'm sure you're shocked to hear. With them, he had a reputation of being a quote unquote vicious, cruel man who was usually and frequently involved in mindless violence this is a quote fighting for territory mindless violence yeah just violence for violence sake literally tc's life in the early 80s he was running multiple small time petty schemes he was selling uh stolen goods he was extorting money from various groups of people he was essentially born to be an ice cream van driver yeah 100 percent. this is the life made for him yeah exactly like he didn't choose the ice cream van life it chose, it chose him, him. Yeah. 100 it, it like sought him out Truly, truly. Now, by the end of 1983, there were rumors circulating in Glasgow's East End about Marchetti drivers being run out of neighborhoods or followed on their runs by suspicious cars. Mm. In Haghill, Reed Robertson, who was actually the man that sold Tommy Campbell his first van, started getting threats that if he didn't abandon his lucrative Haghill route, then his van would be blown up. Oh, just yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. According to Skeleton, the worst that happened, quote, was a brick being thrown through his rear window. Oh, did that's the just worst. That. And it, isn't that crazy when you're like, well, the worst thing that yeah, happened. Yeah, like, oh, it was nothing. All they did was throw a brick through his window. He was all worried. And like, then he just got a brick launched through his back window. Like, that was no big small deal. Small potatoes. Small potatoes. Yeah, but it didn't matter was to read. Skeleton? Skeleton, yeah. Because it just makes me think of Skeleton. Skeleton. Yeah, as yeah. soon as you said it, I was like, Skeleton. Skeleton. Oh, I miss Skeleton. I do too. I haven't seen him in a while. Yeah, go and see his family. Yeah, he went and, see, he went and saw his family. Family. Yeah. yeah. He'll be back, though. So he must he must have had a good time with his family. <laughs> like, he's looking at us like, ah. Like, what the fuck? Skeleton. Yeah, if you don't know that, uh, that's We've what, definitely told that story. That's what your youngest, her, like, a little imaginary yeah, friend. Yeah, that was her, her Perhaps guy. real. That was her guy. Her man. You know? You just sit there. Posing on the bookshelf. Just living. Just living. Yeah, you know. Then he would just go visit his family. Family. Yeah. <laughs> well, the skeleton just said, like, skeleton. it's just a just a brick in your window. The skeleton is different. He's Sorry. different. I was just about to laugh and then I was going to die. We gave Elena some time to die. I had to have a second. Yeah, but she okay now. I'm okay. She's okay. I'm back. Um, That's really funny. I just got a uh, notification from Uber Eats and that just feels like fitting for this wow. case. Wow. What do they want from me? I don't know. <laughs> what do you want from me, Uber Eats? <laughs> they want me to order. Um, <laughs> they want you to lease a van. No. Never. A clapped out banger van. <laughs> I mean, they twist my arm. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, so Reed, he has this whole thing thrown through his windshield. Yeah, he does. Skeleton's like, yeah, no big deal. Reed's like, big deal. Uh, I'm not going to sit around and wait for things to get worse. Uh, everybody take my route. Here you Reed go. Reed for the win. Yeah. That's what I would do. I'd be like, yeah, no, nah, that's as bad as that gets. Yeah, he gave up his route. And it also wasn't just the Marchetti drivers being targeted. At the end of September, a 50s uh, ice dri- ICE's driver was just wrapping up the end of his run in Rukesi, and he was going to be calling it a night. As he was finishing up, he saw a dark colored Ford Escort pull up behind his van. And then two men wearing masks came out from the car, no. both holding shotguns. Nope. The driver, John Brady, immediately threw his van into gear, put the pedal to the fucking metal, and sped away. And as he sped away, these masked men banged on the sides of the van, smashed one of the windows in, and just the whole time were like screaming threats to Brady. This is a lot. This is terrifying one might say this is the most also the fact that this happened and i have never ever ever heard of it me neither fucking bonkers this is really wild it is now when he made it to safety brady told the van's owner who was samuel mcbride about his ordeal and mcbride took the information to the police in easter house to make a formal complaint it's unclear if the police actually followed up on this complaint. Uh, it doesn't seem like they followed up on a lot of these complaints. It doesn't seem like it. They're like, yeah, that's that's like, they were like your this business. This is annoying. So yeah, exactly. But either way, McBride made the decision pretty quickly after all of this to sell that van 
to Tommy Campbell oh. and leave the ice cream business for good. And that's why that van was a clapped up banger. Yep. The, the, there you go. I was like, there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so like we've been in 1983 for a while. We and have. 1983. The year of John. The year of John. <laughs> what a year. And of escalation in the ice cream world. You know, same thing. And now it wasn't just the... I see no difference. I don't really see any difference at all. That's what I said, right? Quit making yourself laugh. (laughs) Now, it wasn't only the van drivers who were receiving threats of violence and actual harassment. It was anyone even associated with the business at all. This was the case in late October for Marchetti Brothers supervisor, James Mitchell. He just finished his shift and he left the Marchetti garage a little bit after midnight. Now, as he's driving home... A dark-colored sedan drives up behind him real fast with the high beams on. So he slows down. He assumes the car behind him wants to pass. But the other driver came up next to him and ends up keeping pace with him. Oh. Very, um, what's that fucking movie with Jared Leto that we just, we watched it recently again? Oh, um, The Little Things. The Little Things when he does that. Oh, so creepy. Yeah. So he keeps pace. He's just (laughs) driving along right next to him for a few hundred feet. And then Mitchell notices somebody in the backseat roll down the window and point what he believed was a gun in his direction. No. So he banged a hard turn down the next street available, and the other car ended up speeding away. But had he not had a street available, he very well could have been shot. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. From Hags Hill to Cartine to Rukesi, someone had their sights on taking over the ice cream van runs in Glasgow's East End, and they were doing it one neighborhood at a time. Also, if you see a dark colored sedan in these neighborhoods, run. Get the fuck out of there. Run. There was dark colored sedans everywhere. Yeah. I'm like, you know, not a lot of people had access to cars. All of a sudden, they just find access All to cars. All of a sudden, there's just dark colored sedans like coming out of their ears. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. They lurk in. They have so many. It's fucking crazy. In late October, drivers in, this is going to be an attempt. It's called Gartham Lock, I believe. Oh, I love that. It was a suburban neighborhood in northeastern, in a northeastern part of Glasgow. Gartham Lock. But drivers there had become so terrorized that finally the police intervened. Finally. It took I, this long. I just can't get over the name of that. That's all. Awesome. I, I just keep thinking of like Wayne and Gartham Lock. Right? It's wild. I was <laughs> Rock like, on. I'm trying. <laughs> Party on Wayne and Gartham Walk. Now remember, this is 1983. <laughs> At this point, this had been going on since 1978, and the police are just getting involved now. Yeah, I mean, like now at this point, they're like, maybe we should do something about they're this. They're like, you know what? This doesn't seem to be going away no. on its own. So, like, I guess we'll attempt something. It's like an infection. They're like, you know, it's weird. It seems like it's getting worse when we're not remedying it. It's insane. So the police added increased patrols, and they actually even put plain clothes officers in decoy vans in an effort to catch the main perpetrators of this whole thing. Now, the increased police presence, it definitely helped keep the violence and the intimidation to a minimum, but it also just chased the crime out of that specific neighborhood and into others that were less patrolled. Hmm. On October 27th, 1983, three vans in Cartine were attacked in a span of just two hours. Jeez. Mm -hmm. One driver. What'd you say? Efficient. I know. And that's the thing. Like, it really was kind of organized crime. Yes, very much. You know? One driver told police he was working with his usual run at about 8.15 when, quote, four hooded men jumped out of a red Triumph and smashed the van using pickaxe handles and other weapons. Oh, fucking crazy okay now the next morning marchetti's company secretary who at the time was archibald mcdougall yeah it was fucking rad at the time and forever in our hearts he received an anonymous (laughs) call from a quote-unquote gruff individual yep i would like to be described henceforth as a gruff individual individual (laughs) who told him quote I wish I could have a brogue for this, but I I'll know. try to be gruff. It, it, Scottish brogues are just so hard. They are. And I love them. They're so, they're so like pure and, and close to my heart that I don't want to fuck with one. No, I know. Yeah. I know. I'm just going to be gruff. If we can't attack your vans in the North Gartham Lock area because of the heavy police activity, then we will attack your vans everywhere else. And that's what we done last night. If you so don't we get, done last night. I love it. There you go. If you don't get your vans out of the Gotham Lock area, then we'll do it again. I love it. That was pretty gruff, That right? was. That okay. was gruff as fuck. Thank you. I did get a little English. I, w- I would describe you as a gruff individual Thank if I heard you. you say that. Thank you. Like, that's what we done last night. I know. Oh! <laughs> there you go. There it is. That's all I can do, though. Okay, okay. That's all I got. That's what we done last night. You gotta say, that's what we done last night. It's very Boondock Saints. Yeah. 
I mm. like. Except they're they're Irish. Oh shit. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. I think we sounded a little <laughs> more Irish. Thing. We probably did. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Anyway, all I can think of is donkey. That's all <laughs> That's I can all, think of too. So we done last night. That's what we done last night, donkey. <laughs> there you go. Now the van runs runs as we I'm like in a broke. The van runs <laughs> as we know at this point definitely provided a profitable income for those willing to drive the routes, but the increasingly criminal nature of the business started offering even more financial opportunities. Uh-oh. For drivers who didn't want to get directly involved in vandalism or intimidation, <laughs> there were plenty of teenagers in and around the council estates willing to do it for them. For I love just a small price. I love like the the like entry level positions. It's like for those who don't want to get directly involved in the violence and intimidation you, <laughs> you can, can hire this way yeah. yeah it's like you can you can have your own run yeah you can be one of the people who sells the illegal goods yep you can be one of the people who extorts the drivers for protection just, just for their lives or you can be a teenager who's going to vandalize some some who will do the intimidation for the drivers yeah well it's kind of a pyramid scheme yeah there's a lot of different like little tendrils to yeah. this business yeah. and i i appreciate that yeah so so the teenagers this they were so getting in on up. this now it's <laughs> fucking crazy and it's sad too like we're lolling but it's really sad that it came to this well that's in and the thing is when you really because you can like laugh about just like how outrageous it got well and it but sounds then, fictional that's the thing because you think of it as like peaky blinders but like then when you really lay it down and you kind of like peel away all of this it's out of pure desperation exactly all of this so all it's like it. when you really look at the origin of it you're like oh well that sucks yeah like that sucks that desperation causes this mm -hmm. you know it really is like a like a case study on it's society sad. yeah it's really sad <laughs> it is so the teenagers the teens in april 1984 17 year old william hamilton and a group of his friends in the cowden beef estates were paid 70 pounds by a man named thomas lafferty which i, I just like lafferty lafferty yeah um thomas lafferty told this william and his friends to smash up the van of a female driver oh. whose route ran through the neighborhood now lafferty worked for tommy campbell at the time and they were also brother-in-laws and while later William Hamilton refused to say what Lafferty had given him the money for, he did admit to taking the money. And a little over an hour after he took that money, he and his friends were arrested for donning Celtic Tammies, which I think those are like the um, the hats, like the golf hats, kind of, with the tartans oh, yeah, on them yeah. and like the fluffy ball on top. Ah. We're in those. And uh, attacking a van with pickaxe sandals and a sledgehammer. This is, like, very violent. It's the most violent. Very aggressive. And there's, it's just, like, a group of 17-year-olds with sledgehammers and pickaxes. And this is, a, like, a woman's A woman's van. van. Mm. Yeah. I, hopefully she wasn't in it at the time. I know. But they were arrested. Good. Now, at this point, the ice cream van trade had evolved into a small-time gang war for dominance yeah. at Glasgow's East End. But thanks to the occasional police intervention, incidents of violence had been relatively minor. But all of that would change in about four short months, and everything would come to a head in a shocking act of destruction, and it would forever rank Glasgow's ice cream wars as among the worst acts of mass murder that the country had ever seen. Holy shit. This is, like, it gets to a point, like, of just insanity. Like, you wow. think that this is insanity, and it very much is. When we reach they ratchet it up. what actually happens, you're like... What the fuck did you think was going to happen? Uh-oh. So, back to Andrew. Andrew Fatboy Doyle. Our, our guy. Our guy. The efforts to run Marchetti vans out of the Gartham Lock area had been largely successful. And by November, there were only two Marchetti vans operating in the neighborhood. One of those was driven by James Mitchell Sr., who was the father of the Marchetti supervisor who was run off the road. Okay. And um, I lost my place a little bit. And the other driver was Mitchell's 16-year-old daughter, Irene. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's the thing, like... I said women were obviously driving too, but young people were These driving, like 16-year-olds. Yeah. If you had a license, you had an opportunity. Holy shit. Now, the obviously limited competition appealed to Tommy Campbell's sister, Agnes Lafferty, who was driving a van for 50 ices at the time. According to her, the two Marchetti vans, quote, had a monopoly in the scheme and were charging the earth for their stuff. 
And she wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to bring some competition to the neighborhood. So she sees an opportunity here. Okay, Agnes. Now when the Marchetti... <laughs> okay, Agnes. Okay, Agnes. I'm, I'm up here with you, I guess. Yeah. I'm worried well, for you. Yeah. When the Marchetti's company secretary, our boy Archibald McDougall... Our boy of forever. Forever and always. Forever in our hearts. When he heard about Lafferty's decision to begin operating in Gartham Lock, he knew... He would need to add additional drivers in order to lock Lafferty and 50 Ices out of the neighborhood. Damn. So they're all coming up with like schemes yeah. to get the other one out. Schemey scheme schemes. Now, other Marchetti drivers had expressed interest in this run, but the recent flurry of threats and vandalism were still fresh in Archibald's mind. Yeah. And he knew whoever he put on the route was going to have to be somebody who wasn't going to be easily intimidated. Yeah. And that is where Andrew Doyle comes in. Andrew oh, Fat Boy Andrew Doyle. Fat Boy is the one that's not... Is not right. easily intimidated. 18 years old. Imagine that's your... That's your rep. Like, they, they're they like, we need someone who will not be intimidated. We pick you. I'd be like... Oh. I'd be like, oh, my oh, God. Okay. I would pick you. You would pick me? You're not easily wow, intimidated thank you. at all. That is true. Yeah. You but know that. that. That feels good. Yeah, no that, problem. That feels right. I'd pick right. you, fat boy. Yeah. I so, wouldn't do this, though. No. This, this would intimidate me. <laughs> I, I would not pick you for this particular I would not do thing. This. If it was like a different thing yeah. where I didn't want you to be intimidated. Thanks. Yeah, but I appreciate that. I would that. never send you into these streets. Yeah, I wouldn't do this. I would no. be intimidated as fuck. But Archibald did pick Andrew Doyle. He was like him. He's a good choice. He called him and he offered him a van to operate rent free. Whoa. Which was huge. Yeah. Like, that's a massive massive opportunity in order to quote freeze out any competition from rival firms now like we just said this is a big deal it wasn't like people were just throwing free vans at people who needed money left and right no and at the time andrew doyle likely thought this was a great opportunity his family lived in like the newer housing estates there was a lot of them living in one little apartment like this was a huge opportunity yeah, absolutely he had grown up in a large, well-known family, and they were a really liked uh, family. They grew up in Rukesi. He was over six feet tall with a, quote, bulky, uh, excuse me, big bulky build. And that's why his friends and family had taken to calling him Fat Boy. It was oh, okay. a term of endearment. Yeah. When McDougall approached him with an offer to drive for Marchetti, Andrew at the time was actually working as a part-time bouncer at a local bar and sharing an apartment with his family in that Rukesi estate. He, obviously, being a bouncer, was no stranger to violence, and he also wasn't really somebody to shy away from a fight if one came his way. But at the same time, most accounts say that he was very nice, very reliable, just a good dude. Yeah, you just didn't fuck with him. Yeah, exactly. Even Tommy Campbell, Doyle's competition for van runs, described him as a, quote, nice big boy. He wasn't a troublemaker, and he wasn't any sort of threat to anyone. Wow. Yeah. Now, McDougall instructed Doyle to run the same route as Tommy's sister, Agnes, staying either in front of or behind her the entire time. Wow. So they're trying to intimidate her off this route. Yeah. Andrew starts driving in November, and it didn't take long for the intimidation and threats to begin. One night in November, he was actually at home by himself, or not by himself, but at home, like you think you're safe there. Yeah. Watching, yeah, you would think. You would think, watching television with his brother, Stephen, and they hear a car outside. So Andrew looks out the window and he recognizes the driver. So he leaves the apartment and he goes out to talk to the man. But he doesn't get any further than the stairs and he's attacked from behind. Whoa. Yeah. The man knocked Andrew to the ground and then he and four other men proceeded to kick and punch him for several minutes. Oh my God. The attack was the first of a string of what they called back then frighteners which were intimidation tactics used to deter the Marchetti driver from continuing his Gartham lock run. Damn. Yeah. Now, a neighbor testified in court later that she had seen the fight outside the apartment and actually identified Tommy Campbell, uh -oh. Thomas Gray, Gary Moore, and Joe Steele as the attackers. Andrew actually didn't report the attack to the police, but when he informed his supervisor about it, McDougall, he called the Easter House police and did report the attack. The Easter po uh, House police, like, went to look for Andrew to kind of, like, take a statement from him. Yeah. And they ended up having a, f a hard time finding him along his route. And when they did eventually track him down, he was like, no, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> no, I'm good. He's like, nope. And he basically just told them it had nothing to do with them and to mind their own business. Wow. So he knows what he's doing. That's yeah. That's the thing. He's not easily intimidated. He just got the shit kicked out of him. And he's like, I'm not going to police. Yeah. Like, well, I got this. He's definitely very deeply entrenched. Exactly. So the attacks continued through the rest of the year, with Marchetti and 50 Ice's vans taking heavy damage from rocks, bricks, hammers, you name it. 
Just before Christmas, Tony Capuano, a driver for Agnes Lafferty, was on his way home after finishing his shift when four men in a, quote, we red fiesta. A we red fiesta. Pulled out it, and you would think that's not that scary. No. But they pull out in front of him and they throw a mallet through his windshield. Imagine a we red fiesta no. causing that kind of fucking damn. Like, no. That's like sending a little, like, like a, a little Prius. toddler in with like a machine gun like that's the same kind of vibe there that's Whoa. that's the exact vibe through a Whoa. fucking mallet through his windshield damn nearly hitting tommy campbell's mm. sister other sister liz who was sitting in the passenger seat Jesus. so you don't want to fuck with tommy campbell's family no you do not so capuano tried to get away but the men in the fiesta pursued them quote unquote aggressively until they reached agnes lafferty's house and when they reached that house obviously nobody's gonna fuck with tommy's like yeah. family so the car disappeared down a side street now a month later near the end of january irene mitchell's van was parked in the gartham lock when she spotted William Hamilton, that guy from earlier, and a small group of boys headed her way. The Mitchells had run-ins with Hamilton a few times before. I was talking about one earlier. And usually this was at the urging of Thomas Lafferty. So she started the engine and started to pull away, and a hammer came flying through her back window. What is with, like, hammers, sledgehammers, mallets? Like, that's, that's like, very... It's, it, that's like brutality like oh, you know yeah. what i mean like this is so different the way this is being handled yeah you're just throwing hammers like throwing like windshields. hammers and mallets and shit at people like that's just so down and dirty this whole kind of thing shit. is so you down know and dirty. it's so down and dirty it really is and that causes so much damage like you are throwing something to cause like maximum damage and like, like potentially death exactly you get hit in the back of the head with a you fucking crack mallet. a skull easy easy and with like the force that it takes yeah. to continue like crazy. ripping through the air like yeah. that's insane it is so as the attacks increased in both frequency and intensity so did the violence and threats from both sides rumors started circulating about one driver threatening to kill the other but up until this point everybody just kind of thought that was drunk shit talking yeah like everybody's like, oh i'm gonna kill him i'm gonna kill her yeah but that all changed one night in february when somebody fired a shotgun at Andrew Doyle's van while he was parked on a street in Gartham Law. Holy shit. He later did tell the police, I was parked outside of uh, Balvney Street. I went to pick up some bottles which had fallen over. I heard a bang and then saw a hole the size of a football in the windscreen. Jesus. So had he been in that van, he absolutely would have been killed. 100%. Ann Wilson, a teenager who had actually been helping Andrew on his run, told the police that she saw men wearing uh, balaclavas and she didn't see their faces, but she did see that they were driving a dark colored Volvo. Oh, and they were wearing like those masks. Yeah. Like, oh. I, I was like, I had to look up the pronunciation of that and like the picture like the came up. mask kind of thing. Literally, mm. like you just see the eyes. Oh, that's so creepy. Fucking terrifying. And that's, it's like all over roots for ice cream. Ice cream. Technically. And goods, like. You know? <laughs> Nuts. Like this, all the all roads lead back to ice cream. Yeah, that's wild. I know you're never gonna eat ice cream the same after this. Yeah, I'm even still though gonna eat it though, they were barely even selling ice cream. I was gonna point. say honestly, at the end of this, like ice cream is a very loose term when it comes to what this is. <laughs> yeah, precisely. So the day after the shooting, Andrew flagged down a patrol officer to report that four men in a Ford Transit van had been following him that day around Gartham Lock all afternoon. Now a few weeks later, on March 18th, two men in a ford transit van oh threw a brick through the back of his van Guess the back windshield stuff. now despite the escalation of the attacks and the stress that these attacks were probably causing andrew he refused to give up his route and he rarely reported the attacks to anybody he just kind of wanted to handle things his own way wow now a few months later his brother Stephen told a jury um, of an incident in late February in which, quote, Andy was in the house and Anthony asked him about the business of being shot at. Yeah. Andy told him not to say anything and just leave it. He obviously did not want to talk about it. My mother asked him what it was about as well, but he wouldn't say. Andy was just like that. So he's like literally just he's like, he's, don't worry yeah. about it. Like, I, like I've got it anything. under control. Yeah. Now, Andrew was only slightly more cooperative when it came to the local police, telling him he didn't telling them he didn't really know of any reason why somebody would want to shoot him. Yeah. In fact, he told them all of the trouble that started only recently when, quote, the 50s ice ices van came into the area, the one with wait for Agnes on the side. 
Now, it seemed to the police that Andrew interpreted the escalating gang war as kind of just little fights between businesses. And even though he had already been physically assaulted himself, he never thought that he was personally in any real danger. Yeah. Whether this was really how he felt or just an act, tensions were running particularly high by February of 1984. And it seemed that the violence was only going to escalate from here. On February 1st, a supervisor with the Marchetti brothers, he arrived at the garage in the morning to find that at some point in the night, somebody had broken into the building and tried to start a fire with a crude gas bomb. Damn. So at this point, we are, we are, uh, what is the word? Intensifying or whatever. To, yeah. To this is fire. Escalating to escalating. a, Thank you. I couldn't think of the word either. It just, I was like, I'm going to talk until it comes to me. Yeah. And it just went, whoop. I was trying that too. Yeah. But sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. But escalating to arson yeah straight up flames crazy so the uh petrol in a bottle approach wasn't effective at setting the garage on fire but the arsonist did succeed in destroying one of the vans one of the vans did catch fire damn now when the attempted arson was discovered to have failed later that day the arsonist actually returned the next um early in the early morning hours of the next day and tried to burn the building again this time they dumped gasoline through a hole in the ceiling but the flames were immediately spotted by patrol officers in the area and it was able to be extinguished by the police department wow that's but so now we're scary. trying to literally blow up businesses yeah like, not just i mean trying to blow up a van in and of itself is pretty fucking terrifying but now you're d- trying to entire building a whole building yeah crazy <laughs> this is one of those things where it's like does everyone see where this is going oh yeah the does writing anyone want to step the in and be like this is gonna get so much worse that's the thing like the writing was very much on the yeah. wall with this first of all the fact that when the fire wasn't successful they came back yeah it's like come on like these people are intent on yeah. destroying what they want to destroy and it's only gonna get worse and it only did oh the night of april 16th 1984 there was a full house at the doyle's apartment in rukesi Andrew Doyle's parents, James and Lillian Doyle, were home, as well as himself and his siblings, Daniel, Stephen, and Anthony. They also had three guests staying with them. Their other son, James Jr., their daughter, Christine Halleron, and Christine's 18-month-old son, Mark. Oh, no. Now, a little before midnight, Lillian Doyle said goodnight to her husband and her sons, James Jr. and Anthony, and then she went to bed for the evening. At some point in the, hour that, in the hour that followed, the rest of the Doyle family members also went to bed and the house was dark. Now, at some point between 1 and 2 a.m., somebody climbed the stairs to the Doyle apartment and poured gasoline on the door next to their front door. This door was used to access an old coal cellar. And then they tossed a match at the door and the old dry wood immediately ignited. Oh, my God. And this, these are like housing like yeah. like little apartments like they are going to catch there's fire an 18 month old quickly. in there yeah oh so lillian doyle andrew's mom woke up to the sound of her daughter screaming in the night and she woke up to see what she was screaming about now christine's baby actually had been sick with a cold in the last couple of days so she kind of thought oh she just needs help with the baby so she opens the bedroom into the hallway and she's overwhelmed by oh thick God. black smoke and scorching heat That immediately forced her to close the door and stay back in the bedroom. She's fucking terrified. So she goes to the window and she threw it open. Uh, Maybe for like fresh air because she had just basically like breathed in a hole. I was going to say like walked into a fire essentially. Exactly. Or for a potential escape. By then the neighbors had already begun to gather outside 40 feet below. My God. And they were shouting telling her that the fire brigade was on its way. Now, a short distance away, another crowd had gathered, and this one had gathered around 22-year-old Stephen Doyle. Like his mom, he had been woken up by the commotion, and he got up to investigate, and when he opened his bedroom door, he was also pushed back inside by the smoke and the searing heat of the fire. So in a panic, he ran to the window, didn't think too much, just punched through the glass, cut his hand and arm in the process, He breathed a deep lungful of fresh air, went back to the door, and tried to make his way into the hallway to help any family members that he could, but he only made it a few steps before he had to go back into the bedroom. But he was able to grab Dixie, the family dog, before once again closing the door. He literally had no other option at this point, so he went to the window, sat on the ledge for a minute, and jumped three stories to the ground below. Holy shit. Badly, badly injuring himself in the process, but he saved him and Dixie's life. Oh. Lives. 
So local firefighters received the call about the fire at the Doyle residence a little before 2.30 in the morning, and they responded immediately. Their first priority was to get anybody inside to safety, but the flames were still burning, like, way too hot for them to even get to the door. They couldn't even get to the door. So they had to work to extinguish the fire from outside. Now, once they were able to access the apartment, firefighter Gerald Lafferty, so many Lafferty's, I know. He entered the apartment wearing a breathing apparatus, and he was carrying a small extinguisher to kind of clear his way. The first member of the family found was Lillian. She was hanging half in and half out of the window. And as he moved toward her, she screamed at him to help the children first. She was like, don't bother with me. You go get them first. Oh, my God. So in the next bedroom, he found Andrew and Daniel kneeling in front of the windows and uh, James Jr. lying on the bed beside them. Whether out of confusion or just a desire not to abandon their brother, they both refused to leave and they actually had to be dragged from the apartment by firefighters. Oh, my God. If you Google it, there's a picture of Andrew Doyle being taken out of the apartment by the firefighters. And he just looks like in a daze, obviously. Oh, my God. So when Lafferty reached the third bedroom, he discovered James Sr. lying on the floor next to his daughter's bed. This is really, really, really sad. Christine was still in bed, and she seemed to be using her body to shield the baby from harm. Like, oh she God. laid on top of the baby. She was severely burned. She, there were no signs that she was conscious. But baby Mark appeared to be breathing. Holy shit. So the firefighters removed mother and child from the apartment, and they attempted to perform CPR on Christine, but she was gone. Oh, my God. That's so sad. 25 years old. Holy shit. 14-year-old Anthony was the last one of the Doyle family to be found. He had actually been sleeping on the couch in the living room, so he was the most vulnerable one to the Uh. flames. He was badly burned across most of his body. And like his father and brother James, he was laid outside while the emergency responders used a resuscitator to keep him alive. Oh, my God. Now, the extent of the damage to the Doyle's lives and property was massive and shocking. Christine died at the scene Anthony died on the way to the hospital. Baby Mark, unfortunately, died the following afternoon. He was transferred to the ICU at the Sick Children's Hospital in York Hill, but it was just too much for his body. Oh, my God. James Sr. and James Jr. were both uh, both placed in the infirmary burns unit for extensive injuries and listed in critical condition. Oh, my God. Daniel and Andrew were also (laughs) placed in the burns uh, unit, and their situations were considered serious. Stephen had suffered serious back injuries and shattered his left leg when he jumped from that window. He had to get multiple pins in his leg, among various other treatments. Lillian was treated for smoke inhalation and shock, actually, but was actually discharged later that day. So she survived. Several of the Doyle's neighbors, including those who'd attempted to rescue the family, were also treated for smoke inhalation. And these are all innocent people. Yeah. You know, like these are innocent people. I mean, Andrew Doyle to do with this was just running a fucking van route. That's yeah. it. He was he, hired to do this. And everybody was intimidating him and he was just going about his business. And the saddest thing, I think, is that he was sought out to do this. He yeah. didn't even apply for this mm-hmm. job. Like he was sought out. And it's like, this is his family. They didn't have anything. Like, an 18 month old doesn't have anything to do with this bullshit ice cream war. And they weren't even supposed to be there yeah. that like, night. That like sucks. they just happened to be there. Yeah. So his father, Andrew's father, James, or excuse me, his brother, James Jr., died the following day from his burns and smoke inhalation. And within a week, his father, James Sr., and Andrew Doyle also died. Uh, The former of bronchopneumonia and severe burns, and the latter, Andrew, of bronchopneumonia and lung damage from inhaling toxic gases during the fire. So literally almost this entire family gone. That's awful. So as fire officials sifted through the wreckage of the apartment, they couldn't identify the origin point of the fire because, I mean, it had been just like yeah, ravaged. just demolished. The best they could tell was that the fire had started around the door going into the old coal cellar. However, it appeared as though an accelerant had accidentally or intentionally been poured under the front door, which provided the flames a direct path into the main apartment. Wow. So it's likely that whoever set the fire didn't know that the Doyles had been using the old coal cellar as storage. And behind that door were a ton of highly flammable items like tires, dry wood, stuff like that, 
which when held under pressure, created a way larger and way deadlier explosion yeah. than hopefully was intended. Than maybe was intended, yeah. Right. Now, given Andrew's conflict with the drivers from 50 ISIS and the recent escalation in violence, investigators were immediately sus and yeah. assumed that the fire was arson and murder. Yeah. With no time to waste, they set up an incident room at the nearby Easter House station and they were ready to go. Holy shit. So this case was assigned to Detective Superintendent Norman Walker. He was a veteran of the police force. He'd been on the job for more than 30 years. Well. Now, despite having been told about the feud between the ice cream van drivers, he didn't really have any concrete leads. He didn't really have any evidence because everything was burned in the fire. So he was just didn't really have much to go on. He's just going off of what people are saying. Yeah. So he's going door to door in Rukesi. And a few neighbors in Rukesi reported seeing three or four boys in the area shortly before the fire. And another had seen three teenagers buying a can of gasoline a little after midnight on the night of the fire. So Walker finally got his first concrete lead when he interviewed a neighbor by the name of Reginald Rankin. Now, the fact that he didn't just, like, run with this is insane because this man tells him everything he needs, but the detective is like, oh, okay, sounds good. Like, and why would you leader. listen to a man named Reginald Rankin? It's your, it's, you have to. I'd be like, tell me everything. It's an unwritten rule that if your name is Reginald Rankin, everyone has to do truth. what you say yeah. and you're going to tell the truth. Tell me my, prophesize to me. Tell me my future. Please. I'll believe you, Mr. Rankin. 100. Let's go. So that lead, like I just said, would be ignored for years. That's good. This lead that I'm about to tell you. According to Rankin, he and a friend had been driving. And I literally can't believe this has been ignored. Wait, you're going to get so mad. He and a friend had been driving back to his apartment in Rukesi in the early morning hours of April 16th. And he said as he turned the corner into the apartment complex, he was hit on the front corner of his car by a red Ford Escort seemingly racing away from the estate. That's uh, that's pretty pretty damning. Only gets I worse. Say. He described the other driver as a man in his late twenties, early thirties, with quote fair streaked shoulder sh shoulder length huh. hair, of a slim build, and wearing blue denims, a denim jacket, and a yellowish t shirt. Rankin also told the interviewing officers that the man was short, about five six, and had a scar on his cheek, quote Damn. just to the right of his nose. Like literally He's gives like, him everything. This is like a really detailed description. Now, when Rankin got out of the car to confront the driver who had just uh, hit him. Two other men got out of the car, and all three of them ran off and just left the car. Okay, guys. So he checks inside the car. He's like, what the fuck is going on here? And notices a gas can in the back seat, along with a strong smell of gas. We're, real, we're just ignoring this? Now, he didn't report the incident initially or the accident because he didn't have a license or insurance. And he was like, you know what? I think we're just going to let this go. I'm, I'm, I'm going to re-up that and then and I'll let them know. He didn't know about the fire yet either. Yeah. But he came forward once he knew of the fire and the deaths of the Doyle yeah. family. So after telling this story to the officers who were literally going door to door for leads, he expected to hear from them sooner or later. Yeah. No one ever contacted him to follow this up. Guys... <laughs> Like, y'all. How does this shit happen? Is I have, what I want to know. Like, shitty detective work. Yeah. You've been on the force 30 years, and this tip was just literally, like, neatly wrapped in yeah. a bowl and tossed, or in a bow and tossed under your lap. In a fancy, it was under a fancy cloche, and they were just like, voila. Here it is. Here you go, sir. Nah. And they were like, no, I don't want that. I'm going to make my own. Why would I do that? Why? So searching for any lead in the case, or maybe not. Uh, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Perhaps not. And Detective Superintendent Walker started interviewing the men being held at... Uh, Barlany Prison Sea Hall, which was a holding area for prisoners awaiting trial. Now, it was in this sea hall that they encountered a man named Billy Love. He was a thief and he was awaiting trial for armed robbery. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Billy Love was. Absolutely. Yep. And he was there along with his accomplices, Ronald Carlton and John Campbell. Yeah. So Love told Walker that he had information about the Doyle family murders, but... If he was going to give that information, he wanted to be let out of prison. Of course. He has something to gain. He's going to give of you what course. you want. Of course. I don't he's think not he's going to give it up for free. I, in my personal opinion, nothing that he told them is real. Yeah. I mean, he's he's got every reason to lie about it. Exactly. And you know who doesn't? Fucking Reginald. Reginald was just going about his business. Reginald has every reason to, to lie. lie. Exactly. And he, did it. He, was exactly. Like, he was like, I know I was going to get in trouble here, but like people died. So yeah. like, I found that out. And I was like, I got to say something. Hey, I got to say something. And they were like, no, not interested. Believe Reginald Rankin, okay? That's Justice for saying. Reginald Rankin. 
No, none of it. So Walker returns on May 8th with a promise of bail for Love. And Love gives a short version of this story that he says he has. We're just, we're going with the criminal instead of the random witness. Yep, yep. So according to Billy Love, he had been the driver of the red Volvo spotted on the night of Andrew Doyle's van, uh, the night that it had been shot up. He claimed that it was his accomplice, Thomas Tamby Gray, who pulled the trigger. Now, Love claimed that the two had been paid by Tommy Campbell's brother-in-law, Thomas Lafferty, to destroy Doyle's van. That very well could have been the truth. Sure. Because Thomas Lafferty was always giving people money to do bad of shit. Of course. And Billy now, Love was like, I, you know Billy Love. Yeah. He, he was all about that. I believe maybe Billy Love was there that night and like shot at the van. Yeah. I don't know about the rest. Yeah. So he adds that a few weeks later, he was in the Netherfield bar and he overheard Tommy Campbell, Thomas Gray, Joseph Steele, and a few other men that he didn't know talking about setting fire to the Doyle's front door, quote, just to give him a fright. Okay. I don't know if you're, like, um, really big on organized crime, that you're going to be talking about it where people can hear you talk about yeah, it. Yeah, where people can go warn the person that you're talking about just setting like their door on fire. In a random bar? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? His story seemed a little too easy. A little Almost shaky. too good to be true. Yeah. But it fit a narrative that had begun to take shape in the local press. Oh, yeah. It's always good when you come up with the story before you have any evidence. That's that's fine work. Oh, just Fine wait. investigatory work right Just there. wait. So the press, they were chasing down and publishing any and all information they could on the Doyle family murders, regardless of fact or accuracy. They didn't yeah. give a shit. According to Douglas Skelton... It's skeleton. I don't know why I'm saying it weird. The tabloids, quote, were talking about the infiltration of the ice cream trade by gangsters, often citing unnamed sources. I mean, there you go. They're just running amok. A muck, a muck, a muck. So not only did Billy Love's story fit the narrative quite nicely, it also implicated a number of local petty thugs, quote unquote, like Tommy Campbell and Thomas Lafferty, who were well known to be involved in the feud between the Marchetti and 50s ice drivers, uh, and the police wanted them off the street. Of course. It fits for everyone. Yeah. Now, the information from Love led Walker to 23-year-old criminal Joseph Granger, who was an occasional associate of Tommy Campbell. Now, on April 23rd, so this is before uh, Mm. Detective Walker gets the information from Love. Okay. Before he gets this whole story, Granger gave police a detailed nine-page statement in which he confirms his association with Tommy Campbell and acknowledges Campbell's role in the ice cream van feud, but explicitly denied having been in the Netherfield bar, having participated in any conversations about setting fire to the Doyle's front door, or knowing anything about the murder of the Doyle family. Now, his statement was critically important because, among other things, he denied having participated in the conversation at the Netherfield bar more than a week before Walker supposedly got that tip from Billy Love. Huh. Which raises the question, why would the police ask Joseph Granger about his presence in a bar and participation in a conversation that they didn't even know about yet. Yeah, that's strange. How did that work? How did that work? Or was the paperwork just dated incorrectly because uh, you're lying? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So based on the information provided by Billy Love and their suspicions of Joseph Granger, the police arrested Tommy Campbell, Joseph Steele, Thomas Gray, and Gary Moore on May 12th for the arson murders of the Doyle family. Damn. And nearly two weeks later, detectives re-interviewed Granger during which they claimed he broke down and started to sing like a canary. I bet. (laughs) I'm sure. Now, according to detectives, he admitted to his involvement in the fire at the Marchetti Brothers' garage, which he was driven to by Campbell and Gray, he said. Okay. Now, Granger's statement claimed that they cut a hole through the roof and poured gasoline from from small bottles into the garage and then dropped lit matches and pieces of paper in to catch the gas. But interestingly, his statement made no mention of the gas can that was found by investigators outside of the building, which at the time was identified as the can from which the gas was poured. Huh. They're like, oh, they're like, oh, you forgot something. Yeah. Can you go back in that story real quick and add that in? Exactly. It's like the Jesse Muskelly thing. Took the words right (laughs) out of my mouth. 
whenever That's exactly he exactly what I was about. Whenever to say. he would like slip up on a detail mm-hmm. that they had already created, they'd be like, "Oh, did you mean that this entirely opposite yeah. thing of what you just said oh, happened? Did, did you forget that you also did that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Just okay. go back and say what we said. Now you said that this person tied the rope. Did you mean that that you actually tied that? Yeah, you did. Right. That's so it. What you meant yeah. was that, like, you said you poured it from small bottles, but what you meant is like the one that we found outside, that right? Big one. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 totally." Yeah, that one. They're like, "Yeah, absolutely." It was that one. Yeah. But the best part is they didn't even go they didn't even like fix it they were just like like, admitting it yeah whatever like okay there was a can out there who gives we'll just throw that somewhere so finally granger's supposed statement got around to the night that he and the other men planned to burn doyle's front door and a week later he recalled the men dropping him off at home before they left to set the fire so the statements from granger and love appeared to be tying up a number of loose ends of unsolved crimes in the east end huh who knew wow what luck And it also helped the police deal with a few troublesome characters from the neighborhood. Oh, my goodness. And their case was only strengthened by statements made from a number of local teenagers, including William Hamilton, who I would literally bet zero dollars on. I was just going to say, wow, what a worthy source of information. Yeah. He confirmed the accused men's participation in the ice cream van feud and the attacks on vans and drivers. He maybe left out the part where uh, he was completely involved. I was going to say, hello, Mr. Hamilton. Do you have something else to say? Always. So the detectives also managed to get uh, Joseph Reynolds, whose sister was dating Gary Moore at the time of the fire, to identify Campbell and Moore Mm. as having shown up outside his sister's window shortly after the fire had been set. Mm. So they're putting them all in, like, the right places. Of course. So the ice cream wars in Glasgow's East End, they were violent, disruptive, destructive. But for the most part, they were confined to a certain area and within a certain social group, and they rarely affected those outside of the Marchetti and 50s firms. The murder of the Doyle family, on the other hand, really represented a vaguely defined epidemic of crime that outraged the public, and the public demanded that something be done. Yeah. So pressure is being put on the police. Yeah. And then the tabloids and press only complicate things further because they're just sensationalizing all these stories. Of course. It's leading to an increase in social anxiety, panic. The residents want something to be done. But in reality, this was a feud between petty criminals that played out in a poor area of the city. And people outside of the East End rarely ever thought of this area or visited it. That's so wild. Yeah. It's like such an isolated area. But it sounds like this is just so massive and so everywhere and leeching into every part of everything yeah but when you really think about it i'm sure there were most people around that were like what yeah i have i know nothing yeah, like about it didn't that affect them that's confined there and like we don't yeah like we, we don't, don't talk deal about with that. that yeah like, that's not for us wow it's a class thing yeah and it's fucked that other people didn't want to get involved yeah. you know like and and stop it not get involved yeah. and continue it <laughs> let's get involved let's, let's, let's do this like fun. so in the wake of the fire though the feud between petty criminals was blown way out of proportion and dramatized i don't even think is, is that how you say that dramatized Dramat- yeah Dra- i like it dramatized 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 i think it's dramatized. I think it is dramatized dramatized as though it were a complicated mafia conspiracy but under these circumstances the arrest of campbell and his supposed accomplishment accomplices served not only to neatly close this high profile case but also as a demonstration of supposed action from law enforcement to address the growing crime wave yeah now between the negative public sentiment and basically like hysteria tabloid reporting there was little chance of anybody getting a fair trial yeah. when the case finally made its way to court. And that was on September 3rd, 1984. Tommy Campbell, Joseph Steele, Thomas Gray, and Gary Moore, all of them had maintained their innocence since their arrests. But in a case involving the murder of a family, which also included a baby, Ugh. it's really unlikely that anybody gave a shit about what they were saying. No. Now, also charged at the same time were George Reed. Uh, because Tommy Campbell had purchased his first van from him. Oh, yeah. And John Campbell. Those charges actually would be dismissed not long after the trial started, but it's worth mentioning that they were uh, players in the beginning of this. Now, in total, there were 16 charges, ranging from intent to intimidate and disorderly conduct to arson and murder. The trial was six weeks long, and the Crown's lead prosecutor, Michael Bruce, painted a picture of basically a mafia-style campaign of intimidation against yeah. Andrew Doyle and all the other Marchetti drivers, which was led by Tommy Campbell. Mm-hmm. He's the frontman. Now, through the testimony from literally hundreds of witnesses, Bruce presented a condensed timeline that started with Agnes Lafferty and Andrew Doyle's beginning the gar- uh, 
fucking autocorrect hold on gartham lock the gartham lock in the fall of 1983 it set off a pattern escalating violence against marchetti drivers but doyle in particular which then led to the murder of those six uh, members of his family on april 16th 1984 so on paper the case against all these men definitely seemed like a slam dunk yeah thanks to the press the public had already formed opinions of all these guys and their guilt or their innocence guilt (laughs) guilt so all bruce really had to do was reinforce what they thought they already knew support the narrative with evidence and statements to the police but the problem was that a lot of the prosecution's case was built on criminals and other unsavory characters making accusations and claims against other criminals and unsavory characters that's the thing i'm like said she said yeah for instance during an interview with detectives agnes lafferty's daughter carol told us Carol. I just Carol. Carol. <laughs> Carol. Her name was Carol. She told the police that she had seen Joe Steele, quote, quote, carrying a big gun about two feet long in the days before Andrew Doyle's van was shot up. Now, she said that, like, before the trial started. Mm-hmm. She said as much on the stand when she was called by Bruce to testify, but then she was cross-examined by Steele's lawyer, Donald Findlay, and she admitted, quote, she did not know very much at all because she was always full of drugs. Oh, all right. Like, she literally said that. Yeah, I'm just always full of drugs. She was so. like, I don't actually know if I saw that because uh, I'm always full of drugs. So I probably didn't see that. Just the, just the wording of that. Yeah. Is pretty iconic. Now, similarly, other witness, another witness for the Crown, uh, Gordon Ness, testified that he, Steele, and John Campbell were paid to harass the Marchetti vans in the fall of 1983, and that th- the three of them frequently traveled together in Rukesi looking for their targets. Now, like Carol Lafferty, Ness also struggled with addiction, and he later said that he'd been using heavily at the time and actually had trouble remembering the specifics of his previous statement. Uh, so... Not great witnesses. Not great. Now, a few days into the trial, the prosecution's case took several more hits when key witnesses changed their stories, flat out rejected their previous statements to the police, all of the above. Tony Capuano, who the police claimed had admitted to being present during the first attack on Irene Mitchell's van, he testified that he had actually never admitted to such things, that the oh, police were lying. They're just straight up lying. He said he was never present for the attacks. He was set up by the investigating officers. Oh, same thing. The plot the ca- same thing in the case of Joseph Granger, who like was singing like a canary about yeah. everything and had a story that made no sense because things hadn't even happened yet that he was yeah. talking about. His statement was the one that all of these arrests were really largely based on, but he denied ever admitting anything to the police. He told the jury, I swear by my mother's life that I had fuck all to do with that fire. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right. What a statement. Scottish. I swear on my mother's life that I had fuck, fuck all to, to do, do with, with that, that fire. Wow. <laughs> or that fire, excuse me. Damn. Now, like Hamilton had done on the stand before him, Granger testified that he'd never given the incriminating statements to the police. He, all he did was sign them after having been threatened and bullied. Oh. And in addition to those threats, he claimed that the officers, quote, pulled his hair, jostled him, kicked him in the shins, and assaulted him even more pri- prior to him agreeing to sign statements. Damn. Which, like, I believe. I believe. I definitely believe that. So the prosecution really wasn't, like, living their best life. No, definitely not. And then they were dealt another blow on the seventh day of trial when another key witness, Billy Love. Billy Love. took the stand to Uh testify for the Crown. Now, Detective Superintendent Walker's case had been built pretty largely also on statements from Love, who told a similar story when when he was questioned by Bruce under oath. But then he was questioned by Lafferty's attorney, John Smith, and his story started to change. He had testified that there had been no inducements or promises made by the prosecution or investigators in exchange for his testimony. But when Smith pushed back, Love replied, I was told I probably would not be charged. Wow. Hello. Wow. So he literally told them everything they wanted to hear just yep. so he could get out of jail. And then he was like, no, that's not what happened. And then no. he gets a little pushback and he's like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, that's actually exactly it. So the Nailed more and it. more they pushed him, the more his story unraveled and his truthfulness ended up being called into question. But since all and since all these men were being tried together, Love was subjected to cross-examination from every defense attorney. Damn. Yeah. 
one was poking additional holes in his story. The other was poking more holes. Oh, man. Just kept going until Tommy Campbell's attorney, Donald McCauley, finally suggested that Billy Love had been lying all along and had simply gone along with the information that he was being fed by the detectives in order to get himself yeah. out of jail. Boom. So in their closing arguments, the defense attorneys for the accused men rested their cases reminded the jury that the case against their clients was basically all on speculation and supposed statements from people who, under oath, fully denied giving those yeah. statements. Yeah, like, come on. It was a compelling argument, and it was backed up by the seriously limited physical evidence and testimony given on stand during the trial. But it was also an argument that was easily undermined by the, by the prosecution, who told the jury, quote, it is only if you accept the evidence of the accused that you could agree with the defense's submission. So the judge in the case, Lord Kincraig, oh, I just love. I'm loving all of this. Lord Kincraig. All these names. He had similar closing remarks for the jury. He said of the defense's argument that the jury would have to accept, quote, not one or two or four, but a large number of detectives had deliberately come here to perjure themselves to build up a false case against an accused person. Whoa. Yeah. Wild. Lord. So what do you what do you the think is going to happen here? Do you think they're going to get off or do you think they're going to get convicted? I'm not looking. Um, I'm covering anyway. She's covering the screen. <laughs> I don't think I still think they're going to get convicted. You do? Yeah. Okay. Because I think there's like a greater play at, at work here. Correct. Oh, I am. On October 9th, 1984, the jury retired to begin with their deliberations. And that spilled over into the following day. And then the following day, they finally come back with their verdict. Thomas Campbell found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment Damn. with the possibility, or excuse me, with the recommendation that he served 20 years. Wow. He was also found guilty of the shotgun attack on, on Andrew Doyle prior to the fire and sentenced to years in prison to be served concurrently with his previous sentence. Holy shit. Uh, Joseph Steele was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment, also found guilty of conspiracy to assault a van driver and of vandalizing the Marchetti vans, and he was sentenced to six years and one year, respectively, to be served concurrently. I feel like they should all be charged with conspiracy to, like, commit an act of violence against a van driver. 100%. Like, shouldn't they all just get slapped with that immediately, like, all of them across the board? You would think. Yeah. But th not all of them were. Yeah. Thomas Gray was found guilty of the attempted murder of Andrew Doyle in the shotgun attack, and he was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Thomas Lafferty was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder for the shotgun attack on Andrew Doyle, mm -hmm. sentenced, uh, sentenced to three years imprisonment. George Reed was convicted on a lot of lesser charges, including a knife assault on a driver, vandalism, stuff like that. He was sentenced to three years. And John Campbell was convicted of vandalism, conspiracy to commit murder for the shotgun attack, and he received a sentence of one and three years, respectively, to be served concurrently. Damn. Yeah. So all in all, Thomas Campbell and Joseph Steele and really Thomas Gray got like the heaviest sentences, but definitely Thomas Campbell and Joseph Steele wow. got like really intense sentences. So in the end, the verdicts really had little to do with evidence and testimony presented at trial. And really everything to do with the reputations of the accused and what they represented to society. Each of the six accused in the case, all of them, were violent men. They had extensive criminal histories. And they were young, too. So it was like really, yeah, it, it spoke to Absolutely. their character. For Joseph Steele, criminality was just a way of life. It, it was actually handed down to him by his older brothers. And their father. It was kind of just like the family's way of life, you know? Yeah. Now, Reg McKay, who wrote a book with Tommy Campbell, acknowledged the past. He actually referred to Joseph Steele as, quote, a lowlife crook who would rob your granny's meter. Damn. <laughs> but he said he's always believed that the men were innocent victims of a police conspiracy to close a high-profile case. Wow. I kind of believe that, too. Yeah. I think possibly some of them were involved in this, but I'm like... I don't know if I don't were. think it all adds up to what they said. It Not did. all of it. Yeah. So in simple terms, these were bad dudes who committed countless acts of violence and brutality. But a lot of people doubted whether or not they were were, were responsible for the Doyle family. Murders. Yeah. Over the years, Thomas Campbell and Joseph Steele did their best to keep attention on the case and tried to get the ruling overturned. Uh, Steele actually escaped from Berlini Prison multiple times. Damn. One time he escaped, he made it to Buckingham Palace and superglued himself to the gates. I'm literally obsessed with that fact. 
Same. That is the most unhinged shit I have ever heard. Certainly is. Super glued himself to the gates of Buckingham Palace. But was ultimately returned to prison. Oh, oh, he was? Yeah. That didn't work for yeah. him? It was like he's, a, he's not still there, super glued to Buckingham Palace? No, sorry. Wow. Super glue. I'm like, where'd you get super glue? And what did you do? Just like smear it all over and then you just, whoop, stick yourself on there? I know. I wonder if he put it like on his clothes first. Or did he put it on the bars first? Mm. What came first? Let's ask him. The bar or the clothes? I don't know. Wow. Now, the two of them also filed numerous appeals and they were actually allowed out on bail in December of 1996. Whoa. While the appeals court reconsidered their case following Bill Love's 1992 confession that, uh... He had lied to the detectives yeah. in 1984. Shocked. Yeah, he said he, quote, invented a conversation between Campbell and Steele and allowed them to take the blame for his own action in shooting out a Van windscreen. There you go. So he was the one who shot So he was it. actually the one, and he's like, I just let somebody else take yeah, the ball. Yeah, exactly. Nice, Billy Love. So the Court of Criminal Appeals in Edinburgh... Edinburgh. Uh, they reviewed the case and they actually upheld the initial ruling, saying there had been, quote, no reasonable explanation as to why a key witness who now claims he lied during the original trial has changed his mind. Um, Guilt. Yeah, I was going to say. But then the uh, case was appealed again in 2004 after having been selected for review by Scotland's Criminal Cases Review Commission, Ooh. which is, quote, a body set up to examine alleged miscarriages of justice, which I believe this was. The case was chosen when Brian Clifford, who's a professional a professor of psychology at the University of East London, he was chosen to review the evidence and he discovered, quote, a statement said to have been made by Mr. Campbell to police after his arrest was written in the notebook of all notebooks of all four officers with a high degree of similarity. Wow. So that meant four officers yep. sat there and wrote a fake ass statement in their notebooks. And they wow. were like, we'll just say that this is Tommy Campbell's statement. Oh my God. Why would you all write down his statement That's together? That's so fucked up. No. So Clifford concluded that it would have been highly unlikely that all four of them would have been able to recall that statement with the same level of detail. Yeah. Which led him to believe that at least in this one instance, a statement had been fabricated yeah. which if one statement has been fabricated there's more exactly pull the string the whole sweater will unravel mm -hmm. so he reviews the entire case and the commission determined that officers never had probable cause to arrest or sufficient evidence to convict campbell or Steele. damn and the conviction was overruled which allowed both of them to go free oh shit yep. in 2004 in 2004 wow. it was overturned tommy campbell actually died from natural causes in june of 2019 though oh damn yeah and as of now the murder of the doyle family remains unsolved but it is wow. considered an open matter wow and that is the case of glasgow's ice cream war ice cream van wars just wow craziness. i did not see i did not foresee all of that no one did i did not no one did. i didn't know what i foresaw but i did not foresee that and how sad is it that like an entire, an family, entire family was brutally brutally killed for an ice cream route yeah like an ice cream route it's just so somebody else could make better money that's horrific it's so sad and i think whoever went there that day and did do that i don't think they intended to kill that family it does sound like that is so, like, and, and that must be like a thing, like you light the door on fire. Right. Kind of thing. And it just seems like it was just bad luck. And it was the door next to their front door. So I think it was supposed to be like a scare tactic. Yeah, like I know? light your door on fire. Exactly. Don't fuck with me. But like, maybe don't light things like, in doors do on that. fire. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that's bad. And like, don't intimidate people because that's also yeah. against the law. And it's like, of course, it's a fucking house. If you light the door on fire, the whole thing might go up, you idiots. But exactly. it's like, I do... From the sounds of all of it, and I would hope this would be the case, that that was all that was intended was intimidation mm -hmm. and lighting that door on fire. Right. But wow, what a terrible tragedy that followed. Seriously. And it's like, who did it? I know. Who the fuck did it? I don't know. And maybe they did do it. Maybe, yeah, maybe all of them did do it, but it was just that the police didn't go about the investigation in the yeah, right way. Yeah, they didn't correctly you gather. Know, who's to say? The evidence to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm-hmm. Who's to say? Wow. But that's the case of the Glasgow ice cream wars. What a tale. Not food networking at all. Not at all. No. That's not what, what that is. Yeah. But with all that being said, wow. we do hope that you keep listening. And we hope you keep it 
weird. weird. But not so weird that uh, ice cream vans do this, because no thank you. I Don't just like want the there. SpongeBob one with the eyeballs that are gum. There you go. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Prime members, you can listen to Morbid early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus and Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey.